Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Father Isaac Longworth, and let me tell you, it is so weird and also cool to be able to introduce myself as Father Isaac. I just got ordained a priest last week. It was the best day of my life, not going to lie, and I am just so happy to finally be in the vocation that God has called me into. And I've wanted to be a priest for a long time, probably since I was little. And one of the the reasons that I was drawn to the priesthood was because of the lives of the saints. Uh, The lives of the saints, that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about doing this show is because I know the effect that the lives of the saints can have on our lives if we imitate them. And when I was a little kid, I would go to a shrine called Martyr Shrine in Midland, Ontario. And this was a shrine to honor uh, the Jesuit martyrs, the French priests who came to Canada to spread the faith. And they sold in their bookstore, they sold this comic book that my parents got me. And it was a comic book of these priests, probably you know, not your average comic book that most kids were getting, but I had it and I loved it. And it was just showing all of the adventures and the exploits that these priests had traveling amongst the indigenous peoples of Canada and trying to spread the Catholic faith. And there was one of the priests in the comic book that I remember because there's this picture of him standing in front of a crowd of native warriors. And he's boldly standing there with a cross in his hand and behind him, is a burning church. And it's just this epic, epic picture. And I remember looking at pictures like that and saying, I want to be a priest like that. I want my priesthood to look, you know, daring and adventurous like this. There was something captivating about it that grabbed my heart. And this priest in particular that I was looking at in this picture was named St. Anthony Daniel. And he is a, a kind of hero. You know, other kids have comic books of superheroes. I had comic books of priests. Um, and he was a hero that I looked up to who inspired me to become a priest. And I want to share with you the story of St. Anthony Daniel today. Because there might be someone listening in, a young man listening in, who is called to the priesthood and will be inspired in the same way as I was by his life. Well, Anthony Daniels was born in Dieppe, France in 1601. He was born into a merchant family and his parents raised him as a Catholic and he grew up like any other normal French child of the time. But when he was 17 years old, Anthony went to school to study law and he did that for a year. But after a year of studying, he just didn't feel like this was what he was supposed to be doing with his life long term. He was asking those questions that most of us ask when we were that age. What is the purpose of my life? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And so he switched his major to philosophy. Philosophy was uh, studying truth and wisdom. And he thought to himself, well, maybe this will help me answer the big questions of life so that I can know what my purpose is. And while he was studying philosophy, that's when he began to feel this tug at his heart to become a priest, probably because while he was studying truth in philosophy, he became more attracted to the truth, who is Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of truth. And so his heart began to burn for the priesthood to follow after Jesus in that way. And so he joined the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, an order of priests, when he was 20 years old and began to study with them. Now, as a seminarian preparing for the priesthood, Anthony was sent to teach at a boys school. And it was here at the school that he first heard of the opportunity that some of the Jesuits had to go as a missionary to New France. New France is the name that they had for Canada at the time. The French had discovered it and they didn't know what to call it. So they said, hey, let's call it New France. It was a little bit more complicated than that. But anyways, he wanted to go as a missionary to New France to go and minister, yes, to the French settlers there, but also to reach out to the indigenous tribes that lived in Canada and had not yet heard of Jesus. So while he was there in this Jesuit house, he was reading the letters that would come back from the Jesuit priests who were on mission in Canada. These letters would come back and he would read the stories of their adventures in the Canadian wilderness as they were traveling to preach Jesus in the indigenous tribes. And they 
just kept saying over and over again, we need more priests. We need more missionaries. The, the harvest of people is so big out here, but we just don't have enough men. We need more priests. So Anthony was thinking to himself, well, maybe I can be one of those missionary priests once I'm ordained. And his interest grew even more when one of the boys in his class was a student from Canada. He was a native uh, Wendat. He was from the Wendat tribe named Amantacha. And Amantacha had come from Canada to France to study. He had been evangelized by the priests. He had become a Christian. He had left his tribe in order to learn the ways of the French and study in France. And so when Anthony saw how Amantacha's life had been changed by hearing the message of Jesus, his heart began to burn even more to go as a missionary to Canada so that he could reach even more Wendat people with the truth of Jesus like Amantacha had. And so after Anthony was ordained a priest when he was 29 years old, he continued to teach at the school for two more years until he finally got permission to travel to Canada as a missionary. And so his brother was a ship's captain, and so he got on his brother's ship and he sailed across the Atlantic Ocean to Nova Scotia right there on the eastern coast of Canada. And it's interesting, actually, as an, as an aside, my first placement as a priest is going to be in Nova Scotia. So just another cool way that I'm linked to St. Anthony. His first placement as a priest in Canada was in Nova Scotia, just like mine is going to be. But he went there and he ministered primarily to the French settlers for a year before going further inland into what is now the province of Quebec. And he stayed in Quebec for one year, specifically focusing his time there on learning the Wendat language. It was a very difficult language. He was used to speaking French, and the Aboriginal tribes would use a very different pronunciation and sounds that he had to master before he could ever be a successful missionary. But once he had gotten a grip on the language, he finally left the safety of the French settlements and traveled with two other French priests to live among the Wendat people. And his missionary work began for real, no longer ministering to the French, but actually going to the tribes that had never heard of Jesus in order to convert them to Christianity. Now the Wendat tribe, which the French called the Huron, were allied to the French. And because they were allies with the French, they were much more open to receiving French missionaries to tell them about Christianity than some of the other native tribes living in the Canadian forest. But just because they were more open than the other tribes doesn't necessarily mean that it was easy. It was really hard missionary work. First of all, Anthony had to deal with the Canadian wilderness, which is no small feat. He had to go through the freezing winters, the boiling hot summers. Everywhere he went, he was eaten alive by clouds of mosquitoes and black flies that just feasted on him day and night. He had to paddle by canoe everywhere. And when the river ran out and they had to trek across land to the next river, he had to carry the canoe and all of their luggage on his back through the thick forest. He had to carry his weight too. He wasn't just a, a slacker because they would leave him behind if he wasn't able to carry his weight. And this actually happened to him once. Once his indigenous guides decided they didn't want to take him with him anymore, and they just decided to leave him on an island. And that could have been the end of Father Anthony right then and there, if he wasn't luckily found by a chief from another tribe who took him into the village for a while until he could be reunited with his friends. So very dangerous, very arduous travel wherever they went. And if this wasn't bad enough, they were also under constant threat of attack from the Iroquois, the tribe that was the longtime enemy of the Huron people, and they could jump out of the bushes at any moment and kill them all, and that would just be the end of it. So he was in constant threat of danger, and it was a very, very difficult path he had to take. But aside from all these physical difficulties, he also had to go through a lot of spiritual difficulties in trying to convert the indigenous tribes because they had their own very complicated spirituality that involved uh, many different spirits that lived in the forests and the rivers and the animals. Uh, they believed that humans had spirits that when they died, they would kind of go on to this earth-like afterlife where basically they would continue to hunt and fish and farm like they did on earth. And so they had their own system of beliefs and they were very leery 
of any new beliefs being introduced to them. They were suspicious of Christianity, mainly because a lot of the Europeans that had come to them had not come with kindness and love and respect, but had tried to use and even abuse these people for their own gain. And so they were rightly suspicious of Christians, and they were not just going to accept Christianity right off the bat without questioning it. The Huron people were very superstitious. They believed that dreams and omens were a very big deal. They would leave gifts for the spirits. If there was a bad harvest or if they were going to battle, they would leave, you know, food or pieces of tobacco to appease the spirits. And they could also be very brutal. In warfare, if they captured an enemy from another tribe, they would ritually torture them and then cannibalize them after they killed them because they believed that by doing so, they could absorb the spirit of their enemy into themselves, which would make them stronger. So they had some very twisted beliefs that they held on to very staunchly. They believed that their shamans, which were like their wizards or their magicians, could connect with the spirit world on behalf of the tribe. And so these shamans were well-practiced in how to work magic, they could cast spells, they could uh, do sacred dances that would allow them to have supernatural power over the people. They would have these horrible, horrible ceremonies where the shamans would go into fits of insanity. They would howl and run around acting like animals. Honestly, when you read descriptions of what some of these religious practices were like, it's very possible that many of these shamans were actually possessed by evil spirits, by demons, and were channeling these demons to the people who were serving them. Now, on top of all of this, as if this wasn't already a hostile enough environment to try to spread Christianity, many of the Wendat people were suspicious of the French priests because wherever the French priests went, sickness seemed to follow them everywhere. And this was partially true because the French unknowingly brought diseases from Europe that the indigenous people were not used to. They didn't have an immune system to fight this off. And they didn't have an understanding of germs back then, neither the French or the indigenous people. And so the French priests were unknowingly spreading diseases everywhere. And the shamans who hated the priests because they were stealing people away from them, they tried to convince their people that the priests were cursed and that everywhere they went, anyone who believed in Christianity would die of the plague. And so this was the situation that Father Anthony had to come into and try to evangelize in. He had to overcome the superstitions and the irrational fears of the people who he came to serve. He had to gain their trust first. He explained to them that all of the religious items that the priests had brought over, the crucifixes, the holy water, the statues of Jesus and Mary, that these weren't evil charms that were being used to curse the village, but that these were holy things that would help the people draw close to the one true God. He would sit around their bonfires at night and talk with the elders about the creator of the world. And he would tell them that there is only one God who has created everything. We don't need to worship his creation. We don't need to worship the trees and the rocks and the waterfalls. We need to worship the God who created them all. And these spirits who your shamans say that they're communicating with through their magic dances, these are not good spirits. They are demons. They are evil spirits that are trying to keep you away from this God by their lies. And he was telling them that the reality of sin was hurting their relationship with this God. That because of their sins of cannibalism and worshiping false gods, their orgies and their demonic magic dances, these were all sins that would take them away from God and would lead them to a place of eternal suffering called hell. That the afterlife was not some happy place where people could just hunt and fish no matter what they did in their life, but that those who were not found in Jesus, those who did not believe in the one true God, would go to a place of eternal suffering called hell. And they listened to him when he spoke about this because he really laid it down for them. He didn't hold anything back, but he told them God is merciful. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He sent his son Jesus to die for you, that he loves you. 
that if you come to Jesus and you receive the sacrament of baptism, if you are washed in the waters of baptism, all of your sin will be taken away. You will become sons of the creator and he will open heaven to you where you can live with him forever in a joy that you can't even imagine. And they listened to him very respectfully and they asked him a lot of questions. One of the questions he would get a lot is they would ask him, well, we see the things that we worship. We see the trees and the animals and the rocks. We see all of these things, the stars, the moon, and we worship them. But where is your God? We can't see him. And Father Anthony had to explain, no, you can't see him because God is a spirit. He's not able to be seen. But because he knows how difficult it is for us as human beings to worship what we cannot see, he sent his son, Jesus, fully God, into our world as a human being so that we could see him and that he could show us what the creator, our heavenly father, was like. They also asked him, well, why would I want to go to heaven? If you say that if our enemies, the Iroquois, if they became Christian, that we would have to be in heaven with them. I don't want to spend an afterlife with those who are my enemies. And Father Anthony had to explain to them very patiently, part of what it means to go to heaven is that all of your sins are forgiven. That means that there's no more revenge in heaven. There's no more battle in heaven. It's only peace among friends. Yes, even the Iroquois. So all of these things were very hard for them to understand. And some of them did convert and become Christian, but most did not. And it was even more difficult for those who wanted to become Christian because they risked being ostracized and kicked out of the tribe if they did so. Even his old friend from back in France, Amantacha, the student who had come over to France, when he returned back to Canada, he left his Christian faith behind. He renounced Jesus upon returning back to the tribe because the pressure was just too hard to resist. But Father Anthony never gave up. He never got discouraged. He continued to preach Jesus and baptize and teach his small Christian flock. He would visit those who were sick, even when he himself was on the verge of death from being sick, and he nursed them back to health. He baptized them if they were dying and opened the gates of heaven to them. And one thing that he did, which was very successful, was that he would invite the children of the village to come to the church to spend time with him. He was very funny as a person. The kids loved him. He was very joyful. And he would teach them Christian songs. He would put many Christian prayers to the songs and musical chants that they were used to singing. And then when they would go back to their houses, they would be singing these Christian songs. And so the parents began to hear their children singing. They recognized that these kids really liked Father Anthony and they would go with their kids to the church to hear from this priest. They would begin to ask questions and the faith began to spread in the village through the children. Whole families began to convert together because of this strategy. And even Amantacha, who had left Christianity, he eventually had a reconversion. Father Anthony's old friend from France had a reconversion because Amantacha had been captured in battle with the Iroquois, but he had escaped. And he attributed this miraculous escape to God's protection and as a way of honoring God for saving his life, he brought his whole family to be baptized. Father Anthony was overjoyed to recognize that God's mercy was for Amantacha, that even though he had walked away from God, that God had never abandoned him. And so Father Anthony was so happy to extend Jesus's mercy and welcome him back home. And slowly but surely, because of his missionary work, the Christian community among the Wendat people began to grow more and more. More and more Huron people became Christian and the gospel began to spread through Canada. Now, one day when Father Anthony was 47 years old, he was finishing morning mass when he heard screams and shouts from outside the church begin to ring through the air because an Iroquois war party was attacking the village. War cries sprang up all around as the invaders tried to climb the wooden walls around the village. Now, Father Anthony, still dressed in his priestly vestments because he had just celebrated Mass, he moved quickly. 
He went out into the village to pray with those who were wounded. He heard their confessions and he preached Jesus to the panicked villagers. And some of the non-Christians who had ignored him for years finally listened to him because they realized death was probably coming and I need to know where I'm going afterwards. Am I going to this heaven that Father Anthony is saying is for the Christians or will I go to hell because I reject Jesus? And they heard the gospel that Anthony was preaching to them and right then and there, many of them decided to convert. And so he quickly went around baptizing as many people as he could before the Iroquois started to break through the walls. Now, as they began to scale the walls, Father Anthony encouraged the terrified women to take their children and to run away into the forest. And he promised them, I will distract the enemy to give you time to escape. And so as the Iroquois marched towards the church, Father Anthony, clothed in his priestly robes, stepped towards them with a cross in his hand and marched courageously towards the attacking warriors. And they stopped in their tracks. They were amazed by this man's bravery. Who is this Frenchman that is coming towards us with no fear in his eyes? They wondered to themselves, is he one of their shamans? Is he doing magic on us with that cross in his hand? Is that a charm? And it was probably a miracle of God that halted them, allowing many of the Wendat women and children to escape the doomed village behind Father Anthony. But eventually, the Iroquois overcame their fear of this strange priest, and they mustered up the courage to attack him from a distance. They put arrows on the strings of their bows, drew them back, and showered him with a volley of arrows that pierced him in many parts of his body. And he fell to the ground, mortally wounded, until one warrior walked up to where he lay on the ground, took out a gun, and fired one bullet into his chest, killing Father Anthony. They picked up his bloody body from the ground and threw it into the burning church behind him. And that was his final resting place. He had poured out his blood in the Canadian wilderness for the love of Jesus and for the sake of the souls of the Wendat people who he loved so much. And when the priests returned to the destroyed village to search for his body, they couldn't find anything left behind from him. He completely given himself body and soul for the sake of his people. Now, St. Anthony Daniel is truly an amazing model for the priesthood that I really look up to because he was patient. He took time to answer the questions of the people and meet them where they were at. He was merciful, extending the love of Jesus even to people like his friend Amantacha who had walked away from God. He was kind and joyful. Kids loved him. Parents learned to trust him and he won them over with his goodness and his gentleness. He had a missionary heart because he went to where the lost people were. He had a passion to tell people about Jesus, to tell them about the one way to heaven. And he was sacrificial. He didn't run away from danger. He didn't run away from suffering, but he gave everything, even his life for the sake of his people and for love of Jesus Christ. And the church needs priests like him today, priests who are willing to sacrifice, priests who are willing to go out to the lost, priests who are kind and joyful, who are merciful, who show people the love of God in a really concrete way. And there is a vocation crisis in the church right now. And one of the main reasons why I think many men don't feel called to the priesthood is because they have not been presented with priesthood as something that is bold, that is attractive, that is worth giving your life for. But St. Anthony shows us the true heart of priesthood. Strong, tough men who are not afraid to sacrifice. Those are the kind of men that God is calling to be the spiritual fathers of his people. Jesus is calling men to imitate him in suffering and even being willing to die for the church. St. Anthony was like that. He worked hard. He slaved through the wilderness. He was hungry. He was away from his family. He was a rugged man. And he stepped up to the plate to reach out to those who didn't know Jesus. What about you? If you're a young man listening in, 
Are you feeling a tug in your heart to be a priest like St. Anthony was? To step up and be a spiritual father in the church? If that's you, then let me encourage you as a newly ordained priest, go for it. It's an amazing life. Yes, it comes with struggles. Yes, it comes with trials, but it is such a good life and it is totally worth giving your life for Jesus in this way. But the reality is, is that the world needs priests now more than ever. Priests like St. Anthony who were willing to sacrifice for God and provide for his people. It's definitely a high calling. Trust me, there's days when I think to myself, I do not have what it takes. I don't feel strong enough to do this. And I guarantee you, Anthony felt like that too sometimes. But God will give you the strength you need to rise to the challenge. He will be able to take away your fears and fill you with the grace and the strength that you need to overcome your weaknesses. That's what God did with Anthony. And when the time was right, Anthony was ready because of God's strength to stare down the native warriors pointing their arrows at him and die with his chin up for the sake of Christ. That's what it means to be a priest, to be willing to lay down your life for the sake of Jesus. And so let's pray right now that St. Anthony would give us all the grace to become saints and that for those who are feeling the call to become a priest, that they would answer that call. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Anthony, we first of all want to pray right now through your intercession for all of our beloved priests throughout the world, that they would have a heart of fatherhood towards their people, that they would be willing to sacrifice for them, and that the joy of being a priest would be burning in their hearts, that those who have forgotten that joy or have become disillusioned or hurt over the years, Holy Spirit, through the intercession of St. Anthony, I ask that you fill them with consolation, that you would fill them with that joy that they had on their ordination day. And I also pray for all men who are thinking about becoming a priest, who are feeling that call from the Lord to be a shepherd and a father in the church, that St. Anthony, you would help them to overcome their fears, fears that maybe you felt too, that they're not strong enough, that they're not ready, that they'll be miserable, that they're not holy enough. God, help these men to step up and just give it a try, to be able to pray a dangerous prayer to you, like, Lord, I'm not ready, but I'm willing. Send me. Send me to be a priest like St. Anthony. St. Anthony Daniel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.